because it's time to get started and we've got a lot of fun information to cover today. So welcome to everyone who's joined us. You are here for Alumni Day In Fermenting Veggies and we're here with our awesome BSU Larimer County Extension agent Amber Webb today. Um, we know these times can be trying but we definitely hope this can be a fun and educational webinar for you today and uh, we have about 50 people signed up so if you are already joined in you're hearing this so please put in the chat your name where you might be tuning in from feel free to add your graduation year from csu if you are an alum we always like to see that too but go ahead and put in the chat if you'll click to all panelists and attendees uh, and then type in your name and where you're watching from we love to see uh, all the different places that those who are tuning in from are at um, as a reminder, since this is a webinar, you're automatically muted. We can't see you. So if you're enjoying your delicious lunch, we won't be bothered by that at all. But please utilize the Q&A or the chat feature throughout this presentation to ask any questions at all. Um, Amber is definitely someone who loves to answer questions as they come up on the slide. So I'll help facilitate asking your questions. But please utilize either the Q&A or the chat feature to ask any questions at all that you have. Um, in just a moment, my colleague Alexandra is going to put in the chat um, just some information about helpful technology and help if you need anything, as well as she'll put in um, some additional information like CSU Larimer County's uh, Extension website, as well as the Alumni Association's website. So feel free to check any of those links out when she puts those in the chat today. Um, I am very excited to introduce you to today's guest speaker, Amber. Amber is a very proud first-generation CSU alum and is mm -hmm. so happy to serve as the family consumer science agent in Larimer County. And she specializes in home food safety, food preservation, culinary nutrition, and reading cookbooks like novels. So Amber, go ahead and take it away and kick us off today. We're excited that you're here with us. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate it. Um, uh, just like she said, I am super excited to be presenting this topic. This is one of my favorite ones and uh, just so excited to have uh, other alumni here. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing where everybody is from. So thank you for spending your lunch with me. Um, we have a lot to cover, but I'll go through it. And just like she said, if we have questions, happy to answer them. So um, we, with that, uh, we will get started. So we're going to be talking about um, fermenting vegetables, but more specifically, we will talk, we'll talk a lot about sauerkraut, but we're going to go through um, kimchi and some other vegetables as well. So um, let's just get started. So uh, sauerkraut, um, if you've um, ever heard of like the origin of it, it means German for sour cabbage. And it's thought of as a German creation, and most people I think would assume that but actually it was started with Chinese laborers building the Great Wall in China over 2000 years ago. Um, this was a standard fare for them. This is something that really kept them going during that such, uh, I mean, intense uh, a time period of history. I mean, I'm not a historian, but I think that's such an interesting fact. <laughs> um, kimchi was originally made from shredded cabbage, fermented in rice wine, and then buried underground. Um, and this is a staple in Korea even to this day. And if you have ever seen the crocs that uh, kimchi is made in, I've seen some that are as big as, I don't know, six feet tall that are buried underground. And it's absolutely incredible. Um, what a culinary tradition. Um, you can get really great kimchi, um, I would say, in most towns and cities at Asian supermarkets. I just found a couple in Fort Collins that I never knew about. So I'm super excited about that. If you've not given it a try, I highly recommend it. Um, in, in Europe, instead of using wine, like I talked about before, they would actually dry cure by sprinkling salt on the shredded cabbage. And that's to draw out the water to make the brine. And that's something that we're going to be talking, I'll be talking you through that process today. Sauerkraut, though, also, um, it, it was on ships carrying immigrants um, across to the United States, um, as it was another thing that could be used to prevent scurvy. So I've heard of ships carrying limes if they had them available, um, but this is also something that they used, very high in vitamin C. Um, and I can imagine just those big bowls, like big wooden barrels of sauerkraut rolling around on these ships and people using it to, to stay healthy. It's so funny. Um, fermenting around the world. So um, if you are into fermented foods and you are thinking of um, what that might look like, 
Central America is one that has a uh, fermented food called curtido. And this is cabbage, carrots, onion, garlic, and spices. And I've actually seen this. It's, um, it's almost like just a little condiment on the table at restaurants, um, just like you would see kimchi or even sauerkraut. It uses a condiment. Um, it's really delicious, kind of looks like, um, almost like uh, jardinier, if you're familiar with that, a mixture of just different vegetables, but it's like in a clear, um, in a clear brine. Um, Thailand, um, pot guard dong, this is fermented mustard leaf. Um, Malaysia, um, you can see it's durian fruit. If you're familiar with durian fruit, I can't even imagine that. It's, it's stinky on top of stinky, right? <laughs> Um, Ethiopia, um, the false banana plant. In India, they ferment uh, cauliflower stalks. And in Sudan, a wild African legume. Um, I'm not sure what this one looks like, but I really would like to do, I'm gonna do some more research to see if I can get some pictures of these. Um, I would be so interested in trying all of this. So a little bit about the science of uh, uh, sauerkraut and fermentation. So when we're talking about just the, the standard method of doing a sauerkraut from home, you're really doing wild fermentation. And that is um, because the crops that are close to the ground, think about um, cabbage or beets that are actually in the ground, um, or any kind of leafy greens that are really close to surface, not like on super tall stalks, they actually have really great healthy beneficial bacteria that's on those vegetables. And what happens is when you go and you harvest and you take it to ferment it, you're actually um, enabling that bacteria to grow and to flourish. And that's what, where all of the healthy gut bacteria comes from. And it's from that bacteria that was present when the vegetables were growing in the field, which is super um, an, interesting, an interesting cycle. Um, and so what happens when you're fermenting is you're actually giving um, a lactic acid a chance to, um, to start to flourish and to grow as well. And they are um, a part of the characteristic flavor, it's a part of the texture, and it also preserves as well. And when you are um, fermenting, you're actually decreasing the pH. Um, and you, what, that hap what happens is you're actually um, inhibiting the pathogenic organisms not to grow. So I was just talking about the good bacteria you're enabling it to flourish through fermentation, but at the same time, that bacteria, the bad bacteria is being suppressed. So it's pretty interesting. Um, so again, so salt specifically is what you're gonna be using for fermenting this kind of vegetable. Um, this salt is gonna draw out the water and um, the nutrients from that vegetable and it creates a brine. And that sugar, that, that fermentable carbohydrate, is um, exactly what I was talking about before. It's that really healthy bacteria that's growing. What that looks like on a chart, <laughs> I'm gonna minimize my screen here a little bit so I can um, go into uh, my notes section. Okay, so this diagram shows the evolution of the different kinds of lactic acid producing bacteria over time during the sauerkraut fermentation process. So the lactic acid are a diverse group of organisms with diverse metabolic capacity. And this makes them very adaptable to the range of conditions and is largely responsible for the success of fermentation, okay? So look at these different um, uh, uh, lines here and you can see that they grow over time. And as the time passes, the pH changes in that bacteria, okay? The healthy bacteria. So there's three populations that succeed one another in sauerkraut fermentation, and more specifically, wild fermentation. Um, so the bacterial strains responsible for vegetable fermentation are social microorganisms, and um, you can see here that the three are uh, leuconostic menestroides, and I might have butchered that if we have any biologists here in the room. <laughs> but what you'll see is these ones are salt tolerant, they produce CO2, which decreases oxygen, and then the microbes die off. As that one peaks and then uh, goes down, just like you saw in the chart before, the next one starts to kick, to kick in, and that's Lactobacillus uh, plantarum. This one is acid resistant, and it um, produces a lot of acid, and the pH drops, and then the microbes start to die off, the bad ones that we don't want. And as those microbes start to, dry, to die off, then the next, um, back, the microbial, um, uh, secession that's in there will 
start to kick in and then that little line will go up and then go back down. And what, what's happening with that bacteria is that more acid and gas is produced, the pH continues to fall, and then the gas production ceases. And when you're thinking of gas production, this is like the bubbles that you see in fermented foods, if you've ever seen it. It almost has like an effervescent quality to it. And if you think of gases, just like gas at all, it creates that odor. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit, what makes that fermentation, what makes that vegetable a little bit stinky, okay? So one more thing about the science of it is that beneficial bacteria that we are really uh, trying to help create and grow and the stuff that we really like are is the lactobacillus. And you might have heard that if you've heard a little bit about probiotics. Um, they live in the small intestine. They can help you maintain your healthy gut bacteria. It improves digestion. Um, and uh, it's not only in things like sauerkraut, but pretty much you know any fermented food or beverage. So think about kimchi, yogurt, tempeh, uh, miso. And um, these gut-friendly bacteria can help you digest and eliminate your food. They crowd out the unhealthy bacteria. And actually, some studies have shown that probiotics, um, think about all those great um, uh, beneficial bacteria, can relieve irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, diarrhea, even eczema. And they've been shown to help um, to protect against um, various infections and colon cancer. Something that's really interesting that I've never actually had to present about for this slide is I've actually seen some research that's been done in, uh, I want to say maybe, I'm not even gonna name the country because I'm not even sure what it is. However, um, some of the research that's been done during the times of COVID have shown that people who have a regular diet of fermented vegetables have been shown to have a lower risk factor for coronavirus, coronavirus, and that has come out within the last six months. So I'm going to take a look and find out where that came from because, you know, um, we we need to know all we can, right? But this one specifically is super interesting. It's just so 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 good for you. So nutrition about um, sauerkraut. It's low calorie. There's only about 42 um, calories a cup. Great source of vitamin C, so we talked about that earlier, just like um, in uh, citrus fruit, um, really high in B vitamins, um, minerals, and fiber as well. Um, and uh, again, with the touching on uh, the health factors, cruciferous vegetables, so all leafy greens, have been shown um, for a while now that they may uh, reduce the risk of several types of cancer. Um, but however, sauerkraut, because you're using salt, is high in sodium. So if you're concerned about that, um, you can rinse off your sauerkraut before you eat it, um, and then also re uh, rinsing it will reduce the tartness. Um, so okay, let's get into how do we make sauerkraut. I love these photos to get started because of the crocs we were talking about before. Um, when I was first introduced to sauerkraut, this, I was introduced actually in Pennsylvania. So again, back to that German history, the Pennsylvania Dutch, um, they would make sauerkraut in the giant wooden uh, like whiskey barrels that you see even today. Um, and some still keep uh, sauerkraut in their pantries like that and just build layers and layers and layers. Um, you can do sauerkraut in those gigantic proportions, but you don't have to. So on this slide, you can see here a couple different sizes of crocs. Um, these are probably, I'm going to say maybe five gallon, three gallon, um, maybe one gallon, all the way down to what you see here, a quart sized jar. Um, and that is um, just two pint sized jars. So um, not too bad. 32 ounces is the smallest we would recommend. And I actually have a recipe that is sized specifically to get started with one quart. And I think that's really the best way to start. So what do you need to make sauerkraut? Cabbage, that's all you need really, cabbage and salt. Um, what kind of cabbage? Um, there are many different varieties of cabbage out there um, and the amount of natural sugars that are there are gonna be different based on the growing conditions and the variety of the cabbage. So fully mature, large heads with solid white interior is the best. And then the larger the head, think about that, the sweeter it's gonna be. And coming from um, when I had my opportunity in Pennsylvania, I was told that the very, very best kind was an Amish variety. I don't even know if you can get it here, 
that's extremely large, like some of the biggest cabbage you've seen, I've ever seen, but it's flat. It's like shaped like a UFO. And it's, I've seen it, it's um, just in pictures. You look it up, look up cabbage or sauerkraut cabbage varieties and you'll find it. Um, I wish we had access to that. But um, if you are, if you have access to a, a local farm stand wherever you are, cabbage is definitely in season right now. And I was just at a farm stand last week and they had a sale on cabbage for specifically for sauerkraut. A little sign that said, ready for sauerkraut, you can buy in bulk, ask us. So the freshest is the best. If you can get straight from the farmer's market, I would highly recommend that. Okay, so what else do we need? You need salt, but it's important that you use the right kind of salt, okay? Um, you need to use pickling or canning salt. Um, and that's because um, a table salt has preservatives in it, um, it has iodine, and that can actually prevent bacterial fermentation that's necessary to produce sauerkraut. Um, and you also need to make sure that you're using the right amount. And why you need that is because the right salt ratio will help you control the flora of the fermentation. Um, you are, if you use too much or you use too little, it can, um, too little salt will soften the cabbage tissue and yield something that's kind of mushy and maybe just a little bit lacking in flavor. Um, if you use too much salt, you're gonna delay that natural fermentation and it may um, cause really unpleasant flavor. Um, it could cause a dark color or allow yeast or molds to grow. If you see like a pinkish color in your sauerkraut um, at the bottom, um, it's probably because you have too much salt in it. So what's the, what's the standard ratio then? So if you're thinking about starting with just the quart jar, like I was talking about earlier, um, you need a pound and three quarters of cabbage and then only one tablespoon of salt, um, which is really isn't that much. It's not a big investment. Um, if you wanna do a half gallon jar, you can see here three and a half pounds to two, two tablespoons. And then a five gallon jar, um, you'll need 25 pounds of cabbage and 12 tablespoons of salt. And just to let you know, this is shredded weight. So if you were to pick up a large cabbage, set it on the scale and say, okay, I've got two pounds or four pounds or 25 pounds, you're not um, measuring the outer leaves that you're gonna take off. You're not gonna be measuring the core. And so really you need to take off those parts first, and I'll mention that in a second, um, really the specific breakdowns, but um, the shredded weight is having all that stuff cleaned off, everything chopped and ready to go, and then you weigh your cabbage, and that gives you that exact amount. So the different type of crocs that I uh, talked a little bit about earlier, it's important that you have ceramic or food grade plastic or a glass jar like a mason jar. You don't wanna use a reactive um, metal bowl um, that is going to affect the flavor and it also can potentially um, affect the fermentation. So any of these jars are great. Um, other things that you'll need is uh, weights. So you can see here's a little picture of a really specific kind of uh, clay weight that you can buy, but you don't need that if you don't want to. You can get creative. You can use um, a dinner plate or a glass pie plate um, that's just slightly open, uh, smaller than the container opening. Um, and then you can use, um, you can weigh it down for cork jars um, that are filled with brine. Um, so the way that I do that is actually take, um, if I'm just filling up quart jars, um, I will use, if you've ever seen, so a quart jar, I don't know if you can see this or not, I'm going to try to show you with my water here. I've got, this is a pint and a half jar. Um, sorry, my background is messing things up a little bit. But um, if this is, say this is a quart jar, it has the wide mouth opening. If you use either like a uh, a half pint jar, which is sometimes called like a jelly jar, or even like a quarter size jar, which is half the size of a jelly jar, it's like an eighth of a pint, that will actually fit perfectly inside of a wide mouth mason jar with a little bit of room around it. You can fill that with water and you can put a lid on that and then you can actually use that as a weight for your quart jar to press down to keep that water level up. Um, and it's really perfect for just getting started with small ones. Um, but if you have a larger container, you can actually use um, like a plastic bag to, full of water to weigh it down for the really large containers, um, like with a plate underneath it. And there's pictures of that in a few slides ahead of time. 
Um, but what's important really, these weights we're trying to do is to cover the cabbage so that there is a layer of brine or water between your cabbage, your sauerkraut, and the air. Um, and that's because fermentation um, is, requires anaerobic condition. If you've got air going into that ferment, it's gonna dry it out, it's gonna change all the bacterial levels, and you're not gonna get a good ferment. You need that level of water, a little bit of water to create a really great condition for fermentation. Um, and then the cover. So um, that will help you prevent um, contamination from insects or molds while your vegetables are covered or your vegetables are fermenting. So think um, like the ceramic, um, the, the brown ceramic crock has got a really great lid that you can purchase or even just a plastic lid for the food grade bucket, um, a jar lid um, or, and a clean towel. So before when I was talking about um, doing uh, fermenting like in a, in a mason jar, what I would typically do is if I've got my jar packed to here full of sauerkraut and I've got a small, about a, maybe an inch of water, of brine, creating that layer, I put my little tiny jelly jar inside of this and it'll stick out about halfway up the top. And then there's a metal band that goes around these. What I'll do is I will either put a paper towel or even sometimes like a coffee filter right on top of my weight, it's sitting there, and then I will slide the band down around over the top of that paper towel or that coffee filter, screw it tight, and then it's all sealed up. I can also use a rubber band or some string, and that is creating um, uh, an environment where air can get in and out, so it's not completely sealed tight. Um, air can get in and out, um, but it's sealed up and um, free from get, um, insects or anything getting into that. And if you have questions, we can talk through that a little bit more um, towards the end. I know it's a lot of details, but, and that's the bummer about virtual classes. This is one of the most fun classes because people really get in there and massage the cabbage and have a good time and it's always fun. But um, hopefully this will help you um, want to get excited to get started doing something like this at home. So the equipment that you'll need is a shredder. Um, of some sort. So that can either be like a large sharp knife um, to shred the cabbage, um, or you can actually cut the cabbage into sections that will fit inside of your food presser, food processor um, on the slicing blade. Um, you can just push that right through. I've done that before, it's really fast. Um, mandolins are really great. And then there's also kraut cutters out there. And there's a couple different pictures here that you can see. This is actually like a pretty good sized mandolin. And that square there you're seeing is actually meant for like a half of a cabbage. You just stick that in there and then you can slide it. Um, it's a pretty cool um, piece of equipment. I wish I had one. Okay, so I was talking about before. So what's the next step? You need to um, wash your cabbage. You need to take off the outer leaves. Um, and that's because when you're fermenting and um, you're really, you're, what, you're creating those environments for bacteria, healthy bacteria, you don't know really the, uh, what's really been that, those outer layers have been exposed to, whether it be viruses or um, dirty hands or whatever. Um, just take off those top layers um, and then um, just discard those. You can uh, then slice your cabbage um, and then cut them into quarters. You're gonna to wanna to take the core out of these and then um, put them in your, after all of your cabbage is sliced and it's weighed, put it in your fermentation container. So the next part is you're gonna add salt and then you're gonna mix it thoroughly with a big spoon um, or you can use your hands at this point too uh, and let that salt um, wait for about five or 10 minutes. And what's happening is that you are sweating it, you're allowing for that water to come out um, and then it, it starts to wilt a little bit. If you've ever done that where any kind of vegetable or even just think about uh, making salads that you've added salt to, it'll start to get wilty um, and that's what you want. If you were to add the salt and then just start massaging or um, trying to get it um, to stir right away, it's gonna be really tough. You just, it really needs a little bit of time to mellow. Um, and then using your clean hands, the very best way to do it is just to start picking up that cabbage and just start squeezing it and massaging it until all of those juices are drawn out and they cover the cabbage by one to two minutes, two, one to two inches. 
So this would be like if you're just doing that one quart jar, just get a big mixing bowl. Um, and that's what you'll be preparing in. Just squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, um, stir and squeeze, stir and squeeze. And you can see here, um, there is a really great tool, like a pounding wooden tool that you can use um, for the really big batches, um, which I've done before in classes, um, but for the really big uh, quantities, but at home, really just use your hands. Um, if you wanna try something like that, you could. Um, and then it should be um, your fermentation crock that you're gonna uh, make your sauerkraut in. It should be deep enough so that uh, the rim is four to five inches above the cabbage. Um, you don't want that so full that um, you're gonna have issues with that water or that brine spilling out when it starts to ferment because it will, that, those, that water level, that brine level will rise and change. Um, so let's say you've squeezed for five or 10 minutes, all those juices are gonna come out of it and you'll see there'll be a pretty good amount of liquid in the bottom. Um, then you can start um, moving that cabbage into your container. So you're starting with a big bowl um, if you're doing like a small container, let's say a quart, then you can start taking that cabbage, just, you know, barehanded or with your gloves, just super clean hands, take that out, stick it in the jar, and then start pressing it. You're going to start packing it in. Um, and then you're going to get to that level where you're going to have a few inches to the top. If that juice doesn't cover your cabbage, even after sticking your hand in there and kind of pressing it down, um, it may be is because your cabbage isn't super fresh um, and you want to um, make that that brine level still the right level, you can actually make a brine. And that is just adding um, a tablespoon and a half of canning salt per quart of water. You wanna dissolve it, let it cool down a little bit, and then pour that in the top to create that safe level for anaerobic conditions. Um, and just something on the water, um, just depending on what kind of water you have, uh, you may wanna use distilled or filtered water, um, because if you have a highly chlorinated water or hard water at home, um, it may interfere with your um, fermentation. Okay, so as I was talking before, um, if you have a very large batch of cabbage, like in the big food grade container, in order to create a weight, um, you could actually fill like a Ziploc bag full of the brine to then um, put on top of it. And why would you do that? Just in case that bag leaks in any way, <laughs> having that extra brine on there will ensure the safety of your product. So if you had a bunch of water in there and that water leaked, then that's gonna change the pH, it's gonna change all kinds of things in the, um, in the fermentation process. And then you pretty much have ruined your batch, um, but just make that uh, brine. Then if it does leak for any way, you're just gonna have a lot of extra brine and you can just drain that off, okay? Um, so with your container, what do you do with it? You're gonna to wanna to place it in a well ventilated area has a fairly constant temperature. So you can see here there's a little thermometer, um, which is a great idea. Uh, depending on where your house is, if you have like an extra bedroom or um, like a closet, it might get stinky, but you can do that. Um, if you have a basement, that might be really great as well. You just don't want to put it in something like a laundry room um, where you have um, equipment that's going to be changing the temperature or like a hot water heater or something like that. Um, so for the temperature that's really ideal, here's a little chart for you. Um, this, and this is for a large crock, but even I found um, for a small crock, about 70 to 75 degrees is really the perfect kind of temperature. Um, and depending on what temperature you have, um, it's gonna change um, how long. So let's say you have a very cold environment or a very cool environment and you're fermenting a lot. It's gonna take a lot longer to ferment um, than if you were to have a very warm environment. So I've had um, some experiences where I have tried fermenting in the summertime in uh, an apartment that didn't really have AC or really great temperature control, and it, uh, it fluctuated a lot. And it caused the fermentation to go so much faster, and it almost got to the point where it would spoil um, because it would just, all of the sugars would get eaten up so fast because of the heat. Um, that it, it would, it, I decided just it wasn't a good time. Um, but some people have said that like in a basement or in a cool place, like a, like a really cool pantry, um, maybe like in old farmhouses, the long, slow process is what creates the sweetest fermentation. Um, and really the flavor is gonna be fantastic. 
So what do you do? So you've got your crock, you've got your all of your squeezed cabbage, it's in there, you've got your water level, you've got your weight, you've got your cover now, and you've decided where to put it. Where are you gonna, what's the next step? Um, let's just say you're gonna put it on top of your fridge because you have a fairly cool environment. You're gonna wanna check that container two or three times a week because the fermentation is gonna be happening. The, level, the water level is going to start to bubble. You're going to have some effervescence. And depending on you know, what's going on inside that container, that um, brine level can actually go over the edge and spill a little bit. Um, and so, and what will happen with that is if it does kind of go over and spill a little bit, um, you are potentially going to have some uh, yeast or mold forming on that surface. Um, which is totally fine. You can scrape that yeast or mold off because you have that layer of water that's a protective barrier. Um, and uh, if you do um, miss or that water level goes down, you can replace it with some fresh brine as well. Okay, so you're just checking it. You're just wanting to make sure that you're it's still got a good environment. You're skimming off the yeast, checking the water level. Um, replacing it if you need to. And then what happens what, when it's done? Well, you'll know when the bubbling is stopped. It should smell pleasantly sour, like a good sauerkraut. It should taste good. Um, it should be a little bit more uh, tangy. Um, if you don't want it to smell off or moldy though, um, because then something has probably gone wrong. Um, in your two or three weeks that it takes to ferment just one quart of sauerkraut, it will have a stinky teenager phase, which I say, which is right in the middle of its maturity. <laughs> it'll get stinky in your kitchen for a couple of days. And then within that two weeks, it'll start to die off again. And you won't smell that. You won't have that strong smell. Um, if you want it to go a little bit more sour, put it in a little bit longer. Okay. So once you um, have gotten your two or three weeks done, you like the way that it tastes and you're ready to store it. Um, you can put it in your refrigerator um, for several months, um, but if you want to keep it longer, um, you need to have a little bit more protection on it, and I'll talk you through that. So you can leave it in the crock that you made it in for short-term storage. Um, so that would be, think about, you know, what your container is, store it in a cool basement, um, a garage, if it's a clean garage that you're not um, I would say, you know, moving a car in and out of it. if it's just like a storage garage, that would be good. Um, you need to keep it covered and weighted down. Um, and you may see spoilage on the very top surface um, after opening. You can clean that off and then you can go down to um, this, the cabbage that's really delicious. Um, but then you just need to make sure you pack it up nice and clean beforehand, okay? What I found um, in the refrigerator is um, you can put it in, keep it in the jar that you saved it in. Um, you, the thing about it is, is you don't have to have that water level because you're not fermenting technically anymore. It's fermented, now you're just eating it. It's in the storage phase. So you just keep it tightly covered. Um, um, you can also put it in a plastic container if you want to, or you can put it in freezer bags and it'll keep in the refrigerator for six months. The taste will start to slowly change over time. And I think in the times that I've done it, it actually gets a little bit sweeter and a little bit more mature flavored. Um, and it's almost worth keeping one back in the fridge for a while and taste it against a new one because you will taste a flavor difference. Um, you Amber, can... do you remove the water from the container with, when you're going to store it? I, I may have missed that, but I was a little no. intrigued by that comment. Yes, you can take the water off of it once you're ready to go into refrigeration. Okay. Yeah. I'm taking my own notes to try okay. this as well. Good, good. <laughs> um, okay, so for freezing, um, it works really great. You would just pack it into a freezer bag um, and allow one and a half inches of headspace. So don't pack it so tight that it's not going to have a chance to expand. So remember, like anytime you put anything in the refrigerator, like ice cubes or anything, that water that's in there is going to expand a little bit. So it needs a little bit of room to move. Um, some people have said, um, what happens to all of the healthy bacteria when you put it in the freezer? It doesn't, so freezing doesn't kill any significant amount of culture. Um, and what happens actually freezing it um, causes the cultures to go into a dormant state 
um, but when it's uh, warmed up again to room temperature, um, they become active again and um, are active cultures and provide all those healthy benefits. The difference though is that um, you will taste or you will have some differences in nutrition in canned sauerkraut. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So um, in order to can it, you can uh, water bath can um, sauerkraut um, two different ways. You can either do a hot pack, which is bring the kraut um, and liquid, the liquid that it comes in, slowly to a boil in a large pot. Um, and then you pack it firmly um, into a new mason jar with a half inch of headspace, or you can just um, put the kraut that you've made in a, in a jar, which is called cold pack without heating it. Um, and then you'll also leave about half inch of headspace. You'll wanna cover it with the juices as well. Um, so either way, both can be processed in a canner. Um, you will actually be destroying uh, the good probiotic bacteria that you created by the canning process. Um, however, um, you will see some, um, You'll see some nutrient loss, but not all. So you can see here, vitamin C is heat stable in acidic conditions, which is what we like. Um, uh, niacin is stable to heat. Uh, folic acid is destroyed. Um, fiber and minerals, no effect. However, not all vitamin losses really are gonna have detrimental consequences. Um, think about all the vitamins that we have widely available in other foods in your diet. Americans typically don't have any of these nutrient uh, deficiencies in their diet. Um, so if you are concerned about losing that nutrition, be reassured that you can get that in another way. So maybe being able to can some of your sauerkraut and have it readily available in your pantry is more of a benefit than, um, than not having it at all. So, and you can get that nutrition somewhere else. Um, and then, Think about all the variations that you can do in sauerkraut. I love this slide because this has given me so many great ideas. You can add cabbage, carrots, hot peppers, sliced onions, shredded apples, chopped garlic, shredded beets. Look at all these different things you can add. They're not going to change the pH. Um, you can add a small amount of these and it's going to create such amazing flavor. Um, there's some really great recipes out there that give you um, the same kind of ideas. Um, you just want to make sure that you have the salt ratios right. So you would use the same amount of salt um, and just make sure that you have a pound and a third or three quarters of total vegetables, total weight, shredded weight of any of these kinds of things. Um, mostly cabbage, but some of those added in for a good flavor. Yum. I was yeah. wondering, we had in the uh, chat a question asking if there was any other fruit that you could use the same process, the same process of making sauerkraut with. I saw apples. Yeah. So maybe apples you can add. Yeah. Is there any yes. other fruits that you know of? Um, so they're not right off when you're trying to make sauerkraut. Um, apples, you potentially pears, um, a stone fruit or like a it's not a stone fruit now, I'm, get, I'm blanking out on what it's called. Um, it's the type of really small seed like an apple and a pear has. I would have to look. Um, I know that fruit can be fermented, um, but specifically for sauerkraut, I think that's really the main one. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, when you have sauerkraut and you've got it ready to go, and really my favorite way to eat it is just out of the jar with pork over the sink. <laughs> However, it's really great for marinades and braised meats. Um, and think about um, applications for uh, like German pork roast. Um, and so think about um, why it, it, in German cuisine, how they are mashed together. Um, and it's because the acidity of sauerkraut actually helps to tenderize the meat. Um, uh, so for pierogies and dumplings, um, sauerkraut is a, a classic filling. Um, in Korean um, cuisine, um, there's dumplings um, with kimchi in it, um, but also as soup. Um, let's see, you can add kimchi or sauerkraut to um, grilled cheese sandwiches, um, adding into it a Reuben. Um, you can actually, there's a really great recipe for a um, German chocolate cake that has sauerkraut in it as well that's so delicious, it gets you kind of a sour flavor, um, or kimchi pancakes, which is so delicious. Um, so 
So now I hopefully I've enticed you a little bit. Um, just to um, cover real quickly before we end, some tips for success. Just make sure that everything that you're gonna be using to do this fermentation process is clean. So your kitchen equipment, all of your utensils, your hands, um, because you don't wanna introduce any organisms that you are going to be um, inviting to multiply <laughs> specifically for this process. Um, and make sure that everything is really well rinsed after you've washed it, um, because any, any amount of soap can affect that fermentation. And again, like you said, like I said before, freshness matters. Um, you're gonna have more uh, liquid available when it's um, fresh out of the field. Um, if it's been sitting around a while, it's gonna be a little bit drier and you're gonna have to add brine. And I can say from experience, the very best sauerkraut I've ever had in my life, hands down, was harvesting it directly from a garden, taking it inside, fermenting it for two or three weeks, and then eating it out of the jar. It completely was a different flavor than other sauerkraut that I've had. So freshness really does matter when you're fermenting. So I am going to provide you today with a recipe and step-by-step -step instructions on how to make sauerkraut with a lot of the material that I covered today um, in two fact sheets. So one front and back with lots of pictures um, for a large quantity, and then also just an individual little one pager for the one quart size um, that I was talking you through. So you'll get both of those today, um, as well as the slides. Um, but if you are interested in learning a little bit more about fermentation um, from a state extension perspective, um, National Center for Home Food Preservation is a great one. Um, the University of Wisconsin publication, The Snake Here and Sauerkraut, is great. They also have uh, several recipes for what to, what to cook with sauerkraut, including that German chocolate cake recipe I was talking about. Um, so Easy to pre uh, Preserve is out of uh, Georgia as well, University of Georgia, and the Ball Blue Book has some fermentation as well. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, hopefully you um, have the information that you need to get started. And um, I am happy to take any questions um, if there are any. You can also try out our polls. I'm not sure if it will work, oh, yes. but we could do two of our, the last two polls potentially. Let me try it and we'll see. Well, okay. people pop any questions that you may have into the chat yes. the Q&A feature. We Great. will try, let's see here. And I completely forgot to stop, Rachel. I'm sorry, we created some polls for you all. Oh my and gosh, no worries. Pause. I'll just put them all um, together. I have okay. just combined all the questions. So. Some of them we were going to do at the beginning, but we just have them all together now. I do see a teeny tiny typo on number four. Uh, it's supposed to say somewhat unlikely, not too somewhat likely. But <laughs> you might just be doubly somewhat likely. Feel free to vote. Uh, we'll give it a few more minutes, but if you'd like to vote, we're seeing some of those polls come in and then we'll share the results with you all. Wonderful. Yeah, you do have to scroll down on that poll to get to the next questions. Yes. I yes, threw them all in there since I know I you were just talking so well and I was loving the information. I kind of forgot about <laughs> the polls too. <laughs> I was on a roll. I forgot. We had we had hoped to get some information from you about how you felt at the beginning versus how you felt at the end of this uh, this yes. talk to see if you're feeling comfortable and have the confidence to do it. Um, I would absolutely encourage you to go out, get ahead of cabbage, even if you don't have access to a local farm stand. Um, or farmer's market, because cabbage is in season right now, you can be pretty reasonably certain that the cabbage in the grocery store is fairly fresh. So it's much fresher than a couple of months from now or you know a few months ago where it could have been in longer term storage um, to get to you. But um, yeah, right now would be a really great time. So get that head of cabbage. And then something that I did wanna to mention too about the salt, um, is you, you could use that canning salt um, and just think about the difference um, between something like a kosher salt and like a table salt. Um, kosher salt is really big and um, kind of chunky crystals versus like a table salt is really fine. So when you're measuring out those, um, those salt ratios, a, a tablespoon of salt is going to have actually by weight a lot more salt in it because there's not a lot of space in between those big crystals like you would have with, with kosher salt. So it's important to make sure you have the right kind of salt. Interesting. And I think you can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. If I can do it, you can do it. <laughs>
I love it. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and we'll okay. share those results. And then we do have a couple questions sure. that have come in, but let's take a look at these results and see where people are at. Okay. Some beginners were watching today. Me too. <laughs> I'm new to this concept as well. It's very interesting. That's great. Looks like you have some very likely and somewhat likelies for wanting to try a fermentation project this season. That's so Excited. great. So great. Thank you so much for sharing everyone. I really do appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you all. Let's get to two of these questions here. Zane is curious if the size of the shred affects the taste. I don't think that it would affect the taste, but it would affect the texture um, and how well it ferments. So I think the the more surface area that you can create, the better. Um, so if you have like really big chunks, um, you're gonna have less surface area and less ability to um, allow that fermentation process to really penetrate the cell walls of the cabbage. So really um, thinnest is best for that process and for the texture. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, Mark is wondering if you're still gonna go into a little bit more detail on kimchi. Kimchi, looks like there's a, a little yeah. bit of a curiosity there. Yeah, absolutely, and I apologize, I did kind of skim over that, and that was something I just wanted to add in, but like you said, we were on a roll and I completely forgot. <laughs> um, so, uh, kimchi is, so what I can do is I can talk you through like a, a little bit about the process of kimchi. It's pretty much, well, I'm not Korean. However, there are some Korean experts out there that I would highly recommend looking up on YouTube who talk about very um, uh, traditional ways of making kimchi. Um, part of that is actually taking an entire head of uh, Napa cabbage, which is the long variety, the tall long one, um, creating a paste out of salt, out of gochujang, which is a Korean chili paste, and out of gochugaru, which is a Korean chili flake, um, having onions, having, um, uh, um, blanking on what they're called, uh, radishes, like daikon radishes, and sometimes even carrots, shredding all of those up, um, and then actually just, op you would open up the leaf of the cabbage and massage that paste into each leaf as you go, all the way through the cabbage and then you actually would ferment it as a whole head of cabbage um, and for a very long time. Um, that is something you can absolutely look at uh, on YouTube. I can't remember, I just found the woman's name. She's all over like the culinary scene right now. Bon Appetit and a lot of really famous, really well credited places um, as a, as a, um, uh, it's like really the expert on your know, authentic Korean kimchi, but you can also um, make uh, a different version at home if you don't want to go all out. Um, with the one quart size that I gave you, you can actually add some shredded carrots, some uh, shallots, some ginger, and some garlic, just a couple of each. Mm -hmm. Shred those up with the, the, your head of cabbage, um, and then you can add a little bit of gochugaru, or you can add some gochujang. So again, that's Korean chili paste and Korean chili flakes. Um, and maybe just like a tablespoon or so of each of those, depending on how much you like heat. Massage that into the sauerkraut or to, into the cabbage, and then you can pack that into the jar. Um, and really, it's not a really uh, specific recipe. You just need to make sure you have a pound and three quarters total of all of those ingredients. So a little bit less cabbage, a little bit more of those, um, and then you can try it that way. I know that's vague. If you really want a recipe, I can write that out um, and just send that to you directly. But um, yeah, it's totally doable. Awesome. And I, I do have a recipe for kimchi that came from CSU, um, from one of our PhD students, and she might have been from Korea, I'm not sure. But it's like a days long process to do it authentically. I can get that sent out to you if you want. So put it in the chat box. Um, it's just, it's a lot to do for starting a beginner. I can send it to you though, if you want. It's from extension and um, gone through that whole process of research. So yeah. Awesome. Thanks yes. Amber. That seems yeah. like 
very interesting to dive more into. I just buy mine from the grocery store, but yeah. you, know, you can make it. So it's good to know that, it. right? Yeah. <laughs> we have another question. Um, this person said, I tried a red, red cabbage and beet kraut recipe and it never fermented. Are there any thoughts on why? Oh, interesting. Um, I would say probably you would need to check your ratios again of salt. Um, that's actually one of my favorite ferments is red cabbage. Ooh, I just lost my, um, my speaker here. Um, red cabbage, beets, and ginger. I think it was, I can't remember the three things the person said. Um, you just need to make sure that you have the right ratio of the cabbage to the salt. Um, and so even if you want to use the ratios that I give you on that one quart size, give that a try. Um, but I'm trying to think, why wouldn't it have it fermented? Did you have the right amount of salt? Did you massage it well enough so that all the liquid came out? Did you pack it adequately and provide that layer of brine so that you had anaerobic conditions and had it packed down? Was the temperature right? So if you're in that 70 degree range, maybe it was too cold and it just didn't have the heat that it needed to ferment, or maybe it was too hot and it spoiled quickly. Um, all those steps that I said before really should give you um, all the, the really specific steps that you would need to ferment. Awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have a few minutes left that we can absolutely touch on. I know someone had mentioned at the very, very beginning a question about kombucha. Do you uh -huh. have any experience? I know that's a little different than fermenting veggies, but yeah. do you have any experience with kombucha and making your yes. own? Yes, I do. Absolutely. So we have a fact sheet on kombucha as well that I'm happy to send out. Um, it's if you want to get started, um, the easiest way. So there's a, a website called Cultures for Health, and they actually are a fermentation website, and they have all kinds of fermentation starters. So sourdough, kefir, kombucha, um, they've got um, rennet for starting your own cheeses, a really great uh, source for that. Um, but you can also actually just go to the store and I like to get um, a, a bottle, just an individual bottle of um, kombucha that has the mother in it, um, which is really great. Um, and what you need is you need tea, you need uh, sugar, and you need a starter and some filtered water. Um, and there's a ratio that you would get started with. Um, you'd make your tea, you add the sugar because you need um, your starter to be able to have some sugar to, to eat up and to ferment. Um, and it's a very similar, um, easy way to start with something like a mason jar. Um, and if you want a simple starter recipe, um, CSU Extension absolutely has one to get started. Um, I'd be happy to share that as well. Um, and that takes, I think, about um, maybe 10 minutes for your, your tea to brew. Um, for you to put your starter in, put it on the counter with your cover in your mason jar. And I think maybe it takes about two or three weeks as well. And then that can go in the fridge um, and that's ready to drink as well. You can also put that in a jar in a secondary fermentation with some um, raisins and make it effervescent, which is really great, which is why I love it that way too. So yeah. Fancy. Yeah. <laughs> Fancy kombucha question. Maybe we'll have to <laughs> do a fun kombucha class. We could absolutely point. do that for sure. Yes. That be shorter. Works. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> we can totally right. do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Zane is curious. What about a kefir recipe? It is big for dog community too. Interesting. Um, that is super interesting. I so I don't think that CSU Extension has a kefir recipe specifically. Um, I know there's a couple different kinds of kefir, like a milk kefir, but also a water kefir. Um, and I believe that you also can get that from Cultures for Health. I don't know of any other um, website that, um, I'm sure there's more, but it's a, you can definitely trust them um, and you can get those grains to get started. And they have step-by-step -step instructions for how to ferment everything. Even if you want to get started with sourdough, you can do that too. And CSU has extension, uh, CSU extension has sourdough resources as well. Ooh, yeah. We should just start a fermentation club with the Alumni Association. <laughs> we totally could. I think it yeah. could get kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's People not could a show their projects at home. Yeah. <laughs> Small batch fermentation for beginners. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, we could absolutely come up with maybe a fermentation series. I think that okay. would be really fun. 
Yeah. Um, love yeah. That. And I put in the chat, but we do send out a survey after this event asking if you want even more additional resources than the ones that Amber is going to have me send to you all, as well as any topic ideas. So if any of these things we've touched on today really sparked your curiosity and interest, head over to the Larimer County CSU Extension page. Mm -hmm. Also feel free to put, you know, you'd love to have a class sponsored by the Alumni Association brought to you. We would be happy to partner with CSU Extension on a different topic that you might have an idea on. So I don't see any more questions coming in the chat. Amber, do you have any closing thoughts for us today? Um, I would just highly encourage you to just give it a try. I think as with, you know, all baking projects, all cooking projects, really practice is what makes it uh, successful. Um, and just, you know, think about it as a great distraction to the time that we're living in right now and to be able to see something grow and um, make delicious food that's so healthy for you and your family, I think is such a, a wonderful um, thing to, to do right now. And so um, if you have questions, if something doesn't go right, you can absolutely email me, send me an, a voicemail, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can to help you with those questions. But um, practice makes perfect. Give it a try. You can do it. Um, I think it's just a wonderful activity. So go ahead. Do it. I love it. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I need that motivation in my okay. life. Thank you, yeah. Amber. <laughs> Start small. <laughs> You're welcome. I love it. Uh, Wendy, Amber's last name is Webb, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to include her contact information as well so you can reach out directly. She's very quick at replying to me when I ask her all my fun questions. So, yes. <laughs> um, w E B B. Wendy. Uh -huh. w -E -B -B. Awesome. Thank you all so much, Amber. It was a pleasure as always working with you. Pleasure. I sincerely appreciate it. And I hope you all have a nice fall with some fermentation uh, experiments happening in your households. Uh, be well, stay stalwart, and go Rams. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.